Okay, thanks very much, Marian, and uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Tim Chen. Uh, I will be speaking about this very interesting topic. And uh, first of all, I want to thank Marian to uh, allow me to uh, to share with you. And uh, I'm not an uh, open educator yet, and I soon will be. And uh, and I plus the organizer to have the courage uh, to invite somebody uh, from outside like myself to talk about in this conference. So it's a privilege and honor to be here. Um, I am a, I'm a self-labeled global education activist, which means that I go around literally the world and to talk about education and how to make change to education. And uh, so I've been doing that since 2007 and first started in Taiwan. And I home educate my own kids, there are three of them. And the oldest already 23 and she's now uh, study in US and in the musical theater. And uh, the youngest is eight, uh, 10, so I still got a couple of years to go. And I also teach at National Tsinghua University and which give me a lot of pleasure and pain and to have to deal with uh, college age students. And, uh, and I also um, founded the first uh, experimental education institute, which I will talk about a bit more uh, for the Taipei City government in 2016. That's where Marion and I met. And uh, I'm also a member of the Taiwan's National Curriculum Review Committee, which means that I, together with the other 48 souls, are responsible for the next 10 years of uh, our uh, primary and secondary education, uh, like it or not. And, uh, but we hope we're, we're doing a good job and uh, the reform is in the right direction, at least our hearts are. And uh, I'm also a review committee for the National Experimental Education and, uh, and in the higher learning, which is dealing with the junior college and the bow. So I look, I look at how people are submitting experimental education proposal, and uh, I find there a lot of room can be improved. And I think open education will be an answer to that. And that's what I'll be talking about today. And, uh, and I, as I said, I've been very active globally. So I'm uh, among organizing committee for global home education conferences in 2016, 20, uh, in Rio and 2018 in Moscow and St. Petersburg. And this year, 2020 in everywhere in the world, just like this one. And it was a conference which finished uh, last week and was attended by over 2,000 people. That's 95% of the school age kids were in one way or the other homeschool sometime, sometime this year. So, and, uh, oops, okay, oh, there we go. So why home education and uh, what can we learn about it as an open education movement uh, in Taiwan? Well, the, uh, first of all, I want to talk about the unique part of home education and uh, which in Taiwan we call non-school-based uh, experimental education. And for those of you who are familiar with this, uh, please uh, switch to another channel. Uh, the National Taiwan University President uh, uh, is giving a speech right now about the future of education. So go ahead and do that, but the rest of you I feel free to stay and then, and then let me explain to you a little bit about the story. Um, so the home education in Taiwan is a, it's a very uh, parent initiated uh, legislation process. So i.e. the parents, the bunch of amateurs who just write a law about home education and then they started a whole movement. And, uh, and students themselves are very much part of the activism. So we encourage home, educated students to participate uh, in this whole movement. And, um, and the law guarantees at least two fifths of the, the, the review committee consists of people who actually know what they're talking about, i.e. the participant or group organization which represent the participants. So uh, this is very different to some other 
part of the world where uh, uh, experts or and uh, educators or university professors uh, occupied this review committee, but in Taiwan it's not. And, uh, and homeschool students can have access to any school activity. So basically home education and school education in Taiwan actually work uh, hand in hand. Uh, it's not a rivalry situation, it's actually a collaborative and sometimes it's almost like embedded. So home educator embedded in the school and the vice versa in school but in home education. And so they can take part in different part of the activity in school. So we can kind of swap and take bits and pieces out as well. And, uh, and also the tuition subsidies, which is very interesting that in Taiwan, if you're a high school home educated and you can get up to 2,250 US dollars a year to spend on anything you want. Um, the, and there are, you know, like the latest uh, 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 MacBook Pro, and you know, I'm not endorsing MacBooks, just that something came to my mind. And uh, running on the, the latest M1 chip uh, will cost only half of much of this. So you can have two computers a year if all you want to do with that. And uh, then the government actually provide counseling and support services, and, uh, and especially if you have special needs kids. So, it's really now a relationship that we just hung them dry and then and leave them to do whatever they want. But it's more of a collaboration between uh, government, school, and the parents, so, and, and students. So it's a very interesting, unique uh, in the world, I think. And how we came about in this kind of unique arrangement, um, we have to go back to about 20 years ago. And uh, and prior to 1999, which is last century, and gosh, time flies. And uh, there are only four kind of education in Taiwan, basically. You have a public and private, and you have a vocational school and general schools, so in high school. And uh, establishing a school was reserved for the privileged. So if you are uh, somebody who is um, well connected with the government and uh, you may want to start a private school which requires a big part of land and a very a lot of money uh, as, a, as an endowment and it's required by the law um, to have that. But then starting in 2000, so we start seeing grassroots movement from different local uh, education authorities, jurisdictions that parents started to demanding uh, home education. And uh, so, and there are institutions which will come in and say, well, we're a group of homeschoolers, we want to organize something like that. So it's a very much a button up uh, movement and for 10 years. But very soon this kind of development run into an issue that, that not every local jurisdiction are equally welcome. So some are more, Reserved. They don't want to uh, um, rattle whatever is going on at the moment. And uh, so when the parents go to them and ask, can we apply for homeschooling? They would say, no, because we haven't set up the application rule yet. And there is no procedure in place to accept the application. And then if you ask them, why not? And they would say, because nobody ever applied before. Then they say, well, but I'm here, I'm applying. And then the education authority will say, no, because nobody ever applied before, so we have no rule. So it just keep going on wrong and wrong. There's no end to this vicious cycle. It's just, you know, it's, it's a question to the situation. So in 2011, and, uh, the, the parliament, uh, Taiwan Legislative Union, decided to pass the amendment uh, to force the Ministry of Education to set up a national guideline to allow everybody in Taiwan who would like to home educate that their rights are protected. So, so local government have to follow the guideline or establish their own guide, uh, rules based on the guideline. And so that kind of solved the, the first change of problem. And, uh, but then they didn't solve the second problem, which is uh, 
when the home education uh, is in construct, it, it, it violates other education law, such as compulsory education, um, such as um, the privilege for students, regular students who can um, delay their ministry drafts and, and other things. So, so then there comes in 2015, the government, the, the, the parliament passed a law which dedicated to uh, home education and protection of their rights. And at the same time, they also passed a law which called school-based experimental education, the big orange block in the middle. And the home education are the one on the right, which is a non-school-based experimental education. And, and this is where the uh, the open education movement in the higher education may come into play since 2015 when the law was in place. But at that time, there was not possible for higher education to do any experiments, uh, which may sound like an oxymoron because one would argue that in higher education, there is no need uh, for experimental education. I mean, the whole purpose of higher education is to experiment and learn. Uh, but however, in Taiwan, uh, it is uh, sometimes remarked as that there is only one university in Taiwan, which is called the Ministry of Education. And everybody else is just a branch campuses. And so we, um, in, with that in mind, um, the university really want to break away and uh, want to be free uh, from this uh, mother, like mothership. So in 2018, uh, the, the, the school-based experimental education was further uh, amended to include higher education up to the mass. And, and so now the school-based experimental education can offer associate, bachelor and master's degree. And so interesting enough, and since 2018, uh, people have been applying and try to do exactly that. And I was privileged uh, to be invited to sit on the review board to look at all these applications and then to figure out what exactly does it mean by you know, experimental higher education. And so just a very quick view on the numbers. So since the law has passed in 2015, as I mentioned, and create a new category, of school-based experimental education and, uh, and also public-private partnership or like the charter school, I think. The charter school hasn't changed much and uh, by noticing how uh, the school-based experimental education has grown. And uh, so the number of students has gone up by like 35 fold over the years and a very short period of time, five years. And what that means is that we are now looking at a big growth, but this is only in the middle school time. And you know, so primary and the secondary education and not higher education yet. And there have been several attempts uh, by different universities trying to apply for uh, higher education uh, experimental schools that so far now has been approved. Um, I, it's not because I'm not doing my job. It's just that we as a committee, we haven't come, we haven't come to a reason why those schools um, is doing anything different uh, to, to what the current regime can do. And, and we don't think they are experiments enough. So, so, so today I would like to suggest an experiment that is experiment enough that maybe uh, your interest to all, all of us around the world in the open education community. And this is just a chart to show the number of home educators also grow a lot in, over the last 10 years. And, uh, and especially the penetration uh, because the, uh, uh, the, the number of students and, uh, are declining due to the, the decline of population, the newborn and the birth rate are, are dropping very, very fast in Taiwan. I think right now Taiwan is close to one and a half or even 1.2 and a child per woman, which a natural replacement rate requires 2.1 child per woman. So it's a very serious problem, but that's beside the note. So going back to the, uh, so I so I pick a model. So this is, a very, this is, this is totally unacademic exercise. So please don't hang me for being, you know, very loose in academic work. I'm not 
a scholar and I, I, I have, this is cannot stand the scrutiny of peer review. So I'm just going to say here, you know, decline that this is not very academic. So I took a European Union JRC uh, paper on open uh, education and they, they suggest a framework as you can see on the right side of my slide. And uh, so I use that as a framework and then I say, I apply that to non-school basic experimental education in Taiwan and see how open it is because I want to see whether I can use um, Taiwan non-school as a, as a model to build something. And I found it actually quite open. Um, <laughs> of course, you know, like home education as I mentioned earlier on, was a grassroots movement. It came from the bottom to top. So we designed the whole thing around what we need. And, and we, as a loser of a very, um, um, very active parents, we cannot be, have a unanimous view on everything. Therefore, we by default is very open. So look at access, that means how easy it is to get into home education, uh, non-school based experimental education. Uh, if you apply today, now in, in almost every, every jurisdiction in Taiwan, there's a 99% success rate. So no matter what your education pedag uh, pedagogy, uh, pedagogy is, uh, uh, we, we respect that right. You know, you are free to experiment any, any way of learning, however you define. And the contents are wide open. You can use um, national curriculum. You can use any other country's textbook. You can create your own textbook. You can unschool. Uh, you can not follow anything. You can do things eclectically. And, um, and it's fully recognized, surprisingly enough. Um, when we pass a law, we make it quite clear that uh, not only the homeschool students does not need to follow the national curriculum, but also they are free of exams, i.e. there are almost no other people who will be uh, second guessing how well your child has been educated and uh, you can pretty much do anything you want. And uh, we only look at the process. We look at the learning process and the outcome uh, is whatever it comes out at the end, which may sound a bit scary for a lot of serious educators and saying, my gosh, what are you guys doing? But uh, the results are quite surprisingly well. I mean, the, the non-school based or home educated students have done many interesting things, went on to higher education, started business and so on and so forth. And, uh, and there are some collaborations. Um, like I say, uh, the non-school based home education has to collaborate with the school. Um, some people use them, uh, the school as a, as a free babysitting or child minding facility. Just keep it. But others take it more seriously and, and really use the uh, club and society and so on and so forth. So it's a very open and very collaborative and fully recognized. And, and there's one thing that we don't have is research because uh, we as a homeschool parents were too busy teaching our kids. So we don't have time to, uh, to find out how well our impact is to the greater society. So right now it's nothing. And the rest of European Union framework like strategy, technology, party leadership, so on and so forth. It's just a mixed bag. I mean, you know, there's a whole bunch of homeschool parents. You can't really expect them to do much. Uh, other than try to get their kids together. So with that in mind, can we possibly learn something from the experience of non-school based experimental education and apply it and to create an experimental university in Taiwan? And this is what I would like to suggest. So if you look at this chart, this is what we call the uh, the, ed the ed education diagram in Taiwan, which is to show you where different stage of education. So inside the bold uh, line, the, the thick black line, you'll see primary, junior, and senior high school. Those are the non-school based experimental education. This is how far they got so far. And the experimental school uh, right now, of course, extends to college. So like I said earlier, so you can do uh, two year junior college, 
you'll be you'll see on the top of the, the big bold line and uh, then the four-year college which offer bachelor degree and also master degree which on the top with a zigzag like a ladder kind of shape so it basically is the uh ISCED stage five six and seven that is the area we are thinking right now is it possible to introduce something new and innovative and reshape uh, how we uh, understand higher education is in you know in the modern day but, you know like will be one one step past the 21st century and then and so far nothing new has happened so again, I took this graph from the OECD report on emergency of alternative potential, because I'm looking at alternative potential as one possible way, but I, I want to suggest that the alternative potential and OERs, uh, we can substitute each other for the, for the purpose of discussion. And uh, right now, OERs, <coughs> alternative potentials, uh, most of the time they exist as independent and uh, learning block. So we see on top of the diagram and uh, they're just sitting there, people take it and, and with no, uh, no, no relation to what, you know, what other credits uh, courses you are doing. Uh, some are the most exist you know, like that. So you take it and you read it and then you, 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 you participate in the study and then you leave. Uh, it's like watching a YouTube video or even words like TikTok, you know, just go through 30 seconds and it's gone. Um, there are other models which has been thrown around uh, in the OECD reports. Um, one is the embedded model, which is like uh, another qualification. And uh, so it exists somewhere. And then the OER and OTED potential plugged in. And, and which is happening already in, in some parts and even in Taiwan that um, will recognize uh, some degree may say, oh, you can take OER as part of your degree and uh, if it's recognized uh, prior, first we have to not, you know, you get consent from the school, like I'm gonna take some of the degree online. And of course, with the COVID happening, and almost everybody is doing it now. And uh, a lot of courses just went online, become OER or not. And, uh, and then they become later on in three, in, in you know, a couple of years later, they'll be part of the uh, uh, student's bachelor or associate degree or even master's degree. And then there are recognition of prior learning model, the, uh, what we call the uh, RPA, uh, prior learning. Uh, RPL. The recognition of prior learning is more interesting because it means that uh, prior to joining this qualification or either starting a bachelor's degree or, or associate degree, uh, one already acquires some other uh, credentials. Uh, it can be um, a CPA, uh, charter <coughs> uh, financial accountants, and, uh, or it can be a Google career certificate or Microsoft engineer or whatever. And then uh, you come into this degree and then the, 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 the program will recognize other people's degree, and, uh, which is nothing to do with the organization that is offering the degree. So it's already happening in some schools in London, uh, they already start doing that. They will recognize some uh, industry uh, qualifications as part of their, their degree. And then, and so, so it's starting to open up and make the whole learning process even wider and uh, more possible. And finally, the modular model, which is the one that I would like to propose uh, for Taiwan, is that you basically build the entire learning experience, uh, your um, associate bachelor or master degree program with alternative credential and OERs. So that means that, um, and they are coming from everywhere. They are eclectically. And uh, as long as you have, uh, you know, recognize them prior to the program start and uh, 
usually through some sort of mutual uh, relationship. And, and therefore, one no longer need to offer the same thing everywhere if somebody else already done so and in a much better and nicer thing. And at the moment, students are doing it themselves, like my son, uh, who is 18 year old. And he's an aviator, he, he flies private plane and, uh, and he's on his way to get his private pilot license. He's a jazz musician, he plays in a band and uh, he's a ski instructor. He's got uh, level one, uh, he's the level, level one certified ski instructor by the uh, US uh, Professional Ski Association. And so with so many interests and, 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 and now right now he's trying to uh, become a, a financial planner. And because he realized that all of the three things he wants to do cannot bring financial security. <laughs> so he needs to know how to make money work harder. And so for him to, to do a higher education learning, he just goes online and then find the most suited OER and, and to learn. And, but all of his learning are independent. So, so he's picking, he's trying to find the best place to learn about jazz theories and jazz appreciation, uh, best place to learn about financial planning, um, best course, most interesting courses on ski instructing and so on and so forth. But, but he cannot put it together and call himself uh, a, a, a even associated with it um, right now. And uh, because nobody would let him do that. And, uh, but if somebody already done a very good, uh, for example, the freshman uh, 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 Mandarin course uh, or freshman English 101, and, uh, why shouldn't that course be used by as many students as possible? Rather than every university has to duplicate the same thing and, uh, and, and, and with a various degree of qualities and, and appeals to the students. Why not break it up? And can we actually do that? Um, so I'm looking at the law, the, the experimental education law, which I'm part of, you know, I'm involved in setting it up originally. And uh, so I'm looking at it, can it be open access uh, on, in experimental education? Well, it turned out that it's a, it's a limited, it's a, it's, a, it's a limited yes, because the law actually restricts, the law said that the, the student can set their own student enrollment policy as part of education plan, which is a big breakaway from right now, the, uh, the only university in Taiwan, the Ministry of Education, uh, which has, through the, uh, the, the joint college entrance exam and others set a quota and allocation on how everybody admit their students. But as a experimental university, you can set your own admission policy. So yes, you can have a um, open access to allow as many people to come in as possible. Um, so further, uh, the experimentation are examined by the laws, uh, University Arc and Junior College law, but the government has set a ceiling. Unlike the non-school based, there are no ceiling. <laughs> the the school base has a ceiling, and the ceiling is 160 students if you are offering associate or master's degree only, and up to 500 if you are offering the whole range of degree, or 350 if you offer bachelor degree. So, providing the school hasn't been filled up yet. Uh, the experimental school can offer any, any way to admit their students, uh, whether they can do it without exam, without entrance exam, based on portfolio review or recommendation or, or lottery or donation, whoever donates most money can do it. So there's, there's all, all sorts of possibilities. And uh, so in the way that it's a qualified, yes, it's a, it's a very, it's an it's a, it's a open access. Um, to go to experimental education in Taiwan. And uh, uh, how about open contents? Again, the Article 7 allows schools to set their curriculum and teaching plan and, uh, and all sort of things. So, which means that the school can theoretically, like I said earlier, say, 
hey, we're going to recognize everybody else's OER. And while we also make some interesting OER, which is unique to our university and nobody else is offering, and uh, before the other people are offering, we'll, we'll, we'll sign agreement with other school and recognize theirs and then whatever our students pass there, and then we'll recognize if they have finished the courses here. So, and, and of course, also right now there are many of them, very, very high quality ones are free of charge. So you can bring the cost of uh, offering the, 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 the courses a lot lower than what the school, schools are now doing, is basically duplicating the same thing uh, with the various qualities and content around the country. Every time you open a new university, you have to open the same thing, which the ministry thinks is important required courses. That's actually, uh, you probably don't need to do that. When you can use OER if somebody else is open. So yeah, content can be very open with experimental education. And the, if the pedagogical practice uh, opens, well, I would say that in experimental education, it's open in Harris because uh, in the Article 7, which again allows Article 7 of the Experimental Education School, uh, School Based Experimental Education Act, allow school to design and follow their own education plan. So basically your education concept and curriculum, teaching plan, school system, and creative, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, we can start drawing a school from ground up, ground up with a blank piece of paper, not unlike the picture on the back of Marion. I know it's a virtual screen, but, but we can do that. We can draw school like a doodle and then we can design it from ground up and we don't need to be constrained by anything that is existing in the current uh, administrative uh, regime. Pedagogical thinking, uh, why not recognize somebody else's OER? Why not let the student design their own OER even? And, uh, you know, we are not constrained about that. Why do we need a required degree, required uh, credits? And uh, can the student waive the required credit if they can demonstrate competency already. So all these things can be done in the experimental education law and which uh, we are free to think outside the box or even without the box so to design our, our curriculum. And uh, well, recognition is uh, the biggest thing right now because uh, it's so hard for universities to recognize each other. I don't know why, because it's such a big building. You can see them from miles away. Why is it so difficult to recognize each other? Um, well, it's going to be hard, but I think that will be the challenge and that will be the fun thing to do. Um, because again, Article 7 allows uh, schools to be exempt from the Degree Conference Act, which have very strict rules about uh, how you can, how, how do you describe a bachelor, associate, or master's degree, and what kind of loop they have to jump through? But hey, you know we can do uh, what I call RPO. I, I mentioned earlier, uh, recognition of prior learning. Student came in already with a lot of experience and knowledge, and even professional certification. Why not recognize them? Why do you have to put them through the same drill again when they already are masters? And uh, we can recognize qualifications from each other. Um, like I said, many schools around the world are offering fantastic and uh, excellent high quality OERs and uh, we can actually recognize them and then let students who use them, utilize them and to, as part of their learning uh, in, in our degree. The, the last part is probably the hardest is the social recognition because we can design this, we can build it, we can even start doing this. But if no parents or no employer uh, will recognize it, um, it's going to be very hard sale. So we need to get stakeholders uh, from employers to say, hey, you know, we'll recognize this thing that doesn't quite like what well, you normally get a, a bachelor or master's degree, but, uh, but we, we think it's equally qualified. And that is already happening in some area in the industry, for, for example, especially in the IT. Um, 
example, people cite a lot, and especially in the business press nowadays, is the Google Career Certificate, which Google is now doing worldwide. And uh, people who have Google Career Certificate in areas like IT management and all the other things, uh, they would, Google say they will hire them as if they have a four year degree. Um, which means that the Google Career Certificate is a six month long uh, course, uh, online courses, which is cost, you know, like a fraction of, of, of what the, the four year degree look like. So it's four is a six months instead of four years. And it causes uh, less than, um, uh, I don't know, uh, the, 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 the board of the one semester in, in some of the universities. So, so if the employers start to recognize this kind of alternative, the degree that made up with uh, OERs and alternative credentials, and we're going to see a real paradigm shift in, 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 the, in the movement. And then on the framework, you also talk about collaboration and the regulation has no restriction on collaboration. You know, university are, are free and encouraged to collaborate with, with, with each other. And of course it's hard to find collaboration partner for newly established schools. You know, we're going to create a new school in Taiwan. It's true that, you know, we're nobody and why should people work with us? And, uh, but it's interesting that, um, but there are also some other collaboration which will require additional law, although there are no law to talk about collaboration, but the result of collaboration may affect some law, i.e. if we start to linking up with different universities and then start pooling our OER together and then to do it. And the, the university, the, because right now the Ministry of Education have a rules on how distant learning uh, uh, the, um, courses can be recognized and there are very strict laws about how many hours uh, it, uh, it has to be in face-to-face -face, uh, course offering how many hours of, of distant learning and, and you need to get prior approved or you need to go through the, the school um, um, bodies uh, internal review and so on and so forth. So collaboration itself is fine but the result of collaboration may require other work to be done. And, uh, and then and research. I would argue that the openness in research actually benefit the new players, such as the experimental school, because a school gets recognition by sharing and collaborating proactively. And that's true. Everybody loves to, you know, interesting what other people are doing. And then if a, a, a new school came out and do this thing that we all, Salivary over, so we can't do it because we are part of the Ministry of Education University branches, and then it gets very excited. So, and also such activity will uh, advance and help uh, schools out a goal like recruitment, admission, and uh, brand recognition, uh, talking to employer, and so on, so forth. So, I'll argue that uh, open research. Uh, for experimental school is very, very important uh, if they want to get recognized in this field. So let's look at what this current experimental university looks like in Taiwan. The, the first three columns, and apart from the one on the left, which is just a label, are the three I, I consider uh, more progressive courses or progressive contents and of progressive courses in Taiwan at the moment. And the last one is a fictional XU, which is stand for experimental university. It doesn't exist yet. So, and uh, so you look around and, and, and forget about the, the program name. I mean, every school calls themselves some very interesting, very grand, ambitious name. And uh, so I decided to call the, the fictional SQ as a Taiwan got talent. <laughs> because it's fun to, to call it. And, um, and they are very reason. And uh, the oldest is only like three, four years. And uh, so, and, and the number of students are, are quite different in, in terms of how big the size of the program. And they all require some sort of degree one way or the other. And this is out of 128 uh, college uh, bachelor 
uh, degree required by the Ministry of Education, uh, degree conferring law. So they all require some sort of um, uh, required courses. And is there room for self-design courses? For some, yes. And when NCKU is National Central University in Thailand, it's not possible and you have to do everything. You can mix and match whatever is offered right now, but providing as long as they are offered by the university. So students cannot design their own courses. And um, instead of access, uh, the NCKU is the most flexible. It allows uh, incoming students, people apply straight from high school into the program or people already in the university and want to try something else because they don't like whatever major they're studying. And, the, um, and, and Tsinghua uh, is all internal. You have to get into Tsinghua first, and then you, you, you apply to become the experimental education student. And, and next to Tsinghua, the Jiao Tong University um, is you know, literally next to it. They are just one, one wall away. And they are external, so you only apply as a freshman when you enter, there are no internal transfer parties. And the recognition is a very interesting part. You look at it, uh, Tsinghua is by far right now the most open in terms of the experimental, experimental programs in Taiwan. Uh, Tsinghua will recognize traditional, non-traditional internship and international study abroad. So which pretty much anything Traditional means that whatever courses are offered by Tsinghua right now. And as Tsinghua is part of Taiwan University system, which will also recognize others from Jiao Tong and uh, uh, the other universities under the system. I think Yao Ming is also one of them. And uh, non-traditional will be something like my student at Tsinghua does. Uh, I've been um, teaching a course with only one student in Tsinghua and she designed her own course. So she, um, so for the, for the three year from sophomore to, to, to senior, um, every semester she designed a, a series of courses that pursued her interest of study, which is in experimental education. And, uh, and of course, internship outside the school uh, is to recognize the international study work, so on and so forth. So Tsinghua offers the widest possible recognition and you can pretty much build up your, your 90 or degrees, uh, uh, credit hours you need um, to graduate with a, with a bachelor degree with a whole bunch of things that you want to do. Very flexible, quite free. And Xiao Tong University <coughs> has flexibility of 28 to 33 credits that can be from school courses, outside school courses and others. So, but with the minimum of 16 from school courses. So while Jiao Tong offer some sort of flexibility, it has put the limits on how much uh, freedom you can have. And so in this case, around 16 to 12 credits that the student can design their own courses or do something really innovative. And Chen Gong University only allow 18 credits, which can be what they call interdiscipline project. But the interdiscipline project is actually, uh, is done in a very strict guideline. So they are, um, the students should initiate a, a research project. So it, it's more like a master's degree or PhD kind of mini thesis, mini paper. So the six credit interdiscipline project they initiated themselves and they have a professor or one more than one professor to overseeing the project and then to, to do the projects on the, on the Tango University. So, and for the XU, uh, the imaginary school, and uh, I would say that we should recognize everything. Um, alternative credentials, OERs from local, international, and not just universities, but NGOs, corporate, labs, anywhere. And uh, so anybody's got something interesting going on, uh, we should let the student learn and then come back and recognize it and to give them a degree. So that sums up my presentation, 45 minutes gone. And uh, if you feel free to follow me on Twitter and there's not much posted right now. And uh, 
ask me questions, ask me now and uh, or ask me later on Twitter. And thank you very much. Um, I still have 15 minutes. I can, I, I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you, Kim. <laughs> yeah, very uh, uh, detailed uh, uh, explanation on the Taiwan uh, situation on experimental extinction. Yeah, I know you have been uh, through a lot <laughs> and participated every stage. And uh, for the last slide you showed, uh, is the, the, the XU, is that invented by you? Right? Or is it's uh, kind of a little bit like uh, there's some regulation, but not well regulated. Okay, um, XU is a concept that uh, after, you know, participating, like uh, like Marion said, I participating in the, a lot of experimental university in Taiwan, uh, so experimental education in Taiwan, up and down the education stage. Uh, I came up with this concept and I, 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 I co-named the XU and to, uh, to design a university that is truly open, truly innovative, and, and take the advantage of the uh, OER and, and authentic credential and so on and so forth, and allow students to drive their own learning. So, and, and this concept has been taken up by uh, an, uh, a new NGO in Taiwan, and, uh, and they would like to carry this forward. So we hope to see it launched by 2022. And right now we are looking for partners because a lot of content, uh, learning content will be coming from uh, uh, institutions around the world. So I'm very happy that Mary gave me this opportunity to speak to you all and hope we can take advantage and, and share with each other. Okay, uh, we have a question from Paul. Uh, what is the motivating the interesting? Uh, Paul, do you want to <laughs> open your sure. mic if and talk with us? Sure, sure. Yeah, this is really, really fascinating. I'm finding this very interesting. So, but I'm, I'm curious, Tim, to hear about what's driving the interest in the public in experimental and home based forms of education. Is it, is it that people are not happy with the traditional forms of education? Do they want an alternative or is it that they like the freedom of learning at home and being able to you know, control how the education is provided? And like, what are the drivers, I guess, that, is, that are leading the people that you are working with to pursue this form of alternative education? Okay, yeah, uh, the many drivers and, uh, and one thing definitely is not it's COVID, unlike the rest of the world, and uh, we are pretty much COVID free in Taiwan. So right, right. people don't need to home educate because you know the school got shut down. Mm -hmm. um, the the different age of uh, uh, the uh, I, I would say I'll, I'll separate it from primary, uh, lower secondary, up and secondary. So in the primary, the driver and also of course the decision makers are largely parents, and parents are dissatisfied some of them and I myself was one of them and with the way that the school is run and uh, it's not so much the curriculum itself but how the execution of the curriculum because the school is very much focused on uh, uh, um, uh, drilling and practicing preparing exams and it's not so much of the teachers uh, fault it's so much of the whole society is very um, uh, very conscious about grade and, and, and numerical scores and so on and so forth. It creates a very competitive environment, which I find is very unhealthy. So I decided to take my kids out because I don't want my kids to learn in such a way. And, and so that's in the primary and the secondary, uh, lower secondary. In the upper secondary, uh, it's more to, more to do with students uh, uh, enlightenment, awakening, uh, because I, like I say in my presentation that we offer grant for upper secondary students uh, to home educate and receive money from the government, 2,250 US dollars to be precise, a year. And so therefore, a lot of students in their 15 and 16 realize that 
uh, they are not doing much in the school besides prepping for the, the college entrance exam. And they find their time can be much better used and, uh, and better, much better used for, 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 for the learning and, and get paid and to do whatever they are interested. So, so they're applying to leave the school earlier and to do, pursue their own learning and the way they want to learn. And, and being digital native, there are so many contents out there and uh, in front of OER and others, and they can learn. So we think very innovative kids who are doing as a research assistant in the academic Seneca, uh, in Yangming Medical School and others in the working the lab and pursuing their interests rather than being tied in school and doing exam drill. Thank you. Yeah, I can add something on that as well, because I'm a parent, I'm parents as well. So I, uh, the education system in uh, Taiwan or in uh, East Asia, especially, you know, uh, our parents are very focused on kids' education. So we require the kids to be have a very good grades in school. It's a general phenomenon in Asia, especially in East Asia, like Japan, Korea, China, we all, all, almost all the parents want their kids have very good grades and go to very good university. And uh, yeah, probably that will make their career, future career better. Yeah, that's our parents' goal, uh, most of the parents. However, that, uh, this phenomenon will force the education system, they want to uh, concrete their uh, education content and uh, let the kids to be very good in exam. So, uh, so all our kids are forced to uh, practice a lot of things that's only for the exam and not for a uh, lot studying or lot learning. So uh, yeah, that's, that's a phenomenon for, 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 uh, for, uh, for, for, for here, uh, especially in Asia. So um, yeah, we are talking about this uh, for, uh, for for unleash the education system so that we can have more uh, uh, imagination on the education and the real high, uh, we will lay our open education resource more uh, visible for uh, all, the, all the kids. Yeah, because when we practice like MOOCs uh, in our area, most of the uh, learners in our area, they, they, they see this content to be an ad from uh, of their education. So uh, we try to link the MOOCs to the, 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 the degree program or the credits. So right. they, will have a, 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 they will have their incentive to, to learn this thing. Uh, right. Yeah, that's one way. But uh, in somehow this is some, yeah, they, they still have some problem inside. I would say the MOOCs uh, shouldn't be just a, a, a supplement. Yeah. Uh, to the to the learning. I mean, MOOCs uh, has developed so uh, so well in the past ten years, and uh, it's become so mature that it it, it can be a, a education curriculum is on rights and uh, a, a student led curriculum. Like student decided how they want to learn and explore and just uh, going down the path of their learning. And uh, so it's time to rise up and, and then take the whole world, <laughs> so it's mass forward, open educators. <laughs> yeah, and I think, yeah, MOOCs, got, uh, because we have like done the MOOCs for like uh, five to six years already, and uh, we have seen some changes on the teachers and the, or the professors, because they are doing the MOOCs, so they think they will have to have some mindset change. They change to, to uh, re re refine their uh, uh, teaching material and the teaching method or pedagogy. Yeah, so uh, they, 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 they change their, their uh, course become a, a shorter course and the conceptualized uh, courses. And uh, uh, yeah, they, did, they, they have a little bit difference from the uh, traditional uh, knowledge uh, okay. delivery. Yeah. So I think this is still very good. I can ask another question, Marianne. It would be um, in the early part of your presentation, Tim. You you showed us the laws that have been revised 
or new laws created to even allow experimental schools, which is really, in my view, quite remarkable. Um, there aren't a lot of new laws being created around education. And, and usually government is resistant to the, the, this kind of change in law, unless there's a real, real big demand. And while you showed significant numbers for home education and experimental schools, it's not huge numbers relative to this population size of Taiwan. So I wonder if you can speak to the government's interest in seeing innovation like this happen. And so ideally, of course, there'd be sort of the grassroots drive as well as the top down support for that. And so I'm just curious to hear your remarks about the government's, what the government's interest in enabling experimental schools is. Excellent question, Paul. Thank you for your insight observation. Um, one word, democracy. Taiwan is a democratic society and uh, therefore the government listen to people. And, uh, and we all know that very often in, in democracy that uh, noises, I mean, the, the voices get drawn by noises. Uh, yeah. but interesting enough, in Taiwan, we still managed to uh, to, to pursue um, uh, the, the voices of the minority. So people who are interested in open education, experimental education, alternative education, non-school-based education are indeed minority. Like you said, uh, our number is very small. And uh, so in the, one of the, the slides I have, um, so you can see the penetration for the non-school is one in 10,000 and 2011 when the first initiative was passed. And then of course it grew to the uh, 3.4, 0.34%, but that is still, you know, 3.4 in a thousand. So it's a tiny, tiny winning amount of people. And, and we managed to, to get the government's attention by many ways. Of course, we lobby hard. Uh, we use uh, public media and, and in our discourse. And, uh, and also we, presents a non-threatening reform, i.e. Mm -hmm. we are here not to take away other people's territory. We are not trying to carve into the advantage of the schools or the privilege they enjoy. No, we don't do any of that. We are just a very humble uh, bunch of a bit Nazi radical parents who <laughs> would like something different for our kids. And this is a very modest and humble request from the government. And, and, and everybody should have the, the freedom to pursue happiness, including education choices. And besides, it's part of the international treaty. You know, it's, uh, it's in, the, in the human rights as well as the social participation. So it's through many, many discourse and, and, and dialogue and we can pursue this moving forward. And Taiwan is actually quite, unique and, 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 and fortunate enough to be free of much of the ideology uh, um, noises happening right now, because very often we are able to just discuss issues rather than everybody sit in their own ideology camp, you know, and then we are listening to each other. So we're quite fortunate. And on Friday, this time, on Friday, I'm going to plug my good friend and uh, Audrey Tang, and she'll be the keynote speaker, and she'll be talking more about democracy and open education in Taiwan. Fantastic, thanks so much. It's been really fascinating, I love it. I love your question, thank you. <laughs> okay. okay, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, we have one minute left, so yeah, we will end this uh, exactly at the time. And uh, I think we will have uh, more to discuss, and there are several questions in the, uh, in the chat room. So uh, I welcome you to uh, uh, keep the discussion uh, in the OECD Connect, that we can keep uh, continue this, uh, 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 this uh, questions and the discussion. Thank you very much for participating in this session. Yes, uh, thank, thank you. you so much. And, uh, thank you, Marianne.